Hi, I'm just going to be sharing a video that helps explain some of the things you hear me talk about in my videos. And one of the reasons for doing this is because of a comment I received on one of my videos I did recently. And so without further ado, I'll be sharing this video that will be speaking on another person who uploaded their video and I'll be commenting here and there throughout. So let's go get right into it. Hey everybody. So recently someone drew my attention to a channel called The Beat by Alan Parr. They said that it's a shame nobody's addressing it and suggested I should. So I went to check it out and what do you know, people actually watch this guy. I say that with legitimate surprise because apologetics channels tend to have high subscriber counts and bare bone views, with even A-list apologists pulling 5-10% to of the views I get. It's almost like Christians want to support the cause but can't bring themselves to watch that stuff. So imagine my surprise when I go to Alan's channel and see he's racking up tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of views. I mean pretty dire compared to his subscriber count, but still. People are watching this guy. So I decided he was at least worth giving a shot. If you enjoy this and think I should take on more of his videos, please let me know in the comments. I love how people always say, in the comments. Like where else are you going to tell me that? Whatever, let's start this up. Feeling hesitant about your next step? Jump into the galaxy of Funded Next, the top place for... I've got news for you. Many professing Christians who go to church every Sunday, who give money to their church, and probably were raised in a Christian home, unfortunately on Judgment Day, are going to sadly find out that they are going to hell. And my friend, it is very possible that you watching this video right now very well may be in that number. Let's just pause and think about the level of sheer hysteria Alan's encouraging here. When he suggests that professing Christians will go to hell, he's not just talking about the classic imposter Christians who knowingly fake their way through church without accepting Jesus. That kind of person would have known what they were doing all along and would show up at the pearly gates like, okay, yeah, you got me. But that's not what Alan's talking about. He's talking about people who sincerely believed, but will show up on Judgment Day and be surprised to learn they're going to hell. This is a horrifying vision of Christianity. It suggests that everyone should be constantly neurotic about their salvation and that, by implication, the Bible's instructions for how to get to heaven are inadequate. I mean, right? Christ and to add to that point, he... This Alan, whatever his name is, because I saw his video sometime ago and I decided that I'm not going to watch it. I've heard it too many times before. The presumption, the audacity of believers to think they have to do it to the throne of God to tell you exactly where you will spend your eternity. And of course, they try to do it in a modest way to say, well, they, they're not me saying the Bible says as if they are themselves sure where they will spend their eternity. And so this is one of the reasons I, when I, when I spoke about my, in my, one of my previous video, what I know believe, this is one of the reasons I said, without the concept of hell, many Christians would not hold some of the views they feel today. Well, let us continue. Christians generally have access to the Bible and read it at least some. And those who don't still live in communities where the Bible's message is being circulated. So if, one, scripture made the requirements for salvation abundantly clear and, two, the Bible were organized so the average reader could find the requirements, then a single unified message about salvation would be prevalent through all of Christianity. Any Christian would have discovered it in the Bible or heard it from other Christians and been able to verify it themselves, and any wrong message would have easily and immediately been shot down leaving Christianity with a message that's unified in every way down to the details. 
The fact that Christians can be mistaken about their salvation shows they can't rely on the Bible itself. So where can they turn for answers? Most of you probably have a pretty good idea, but keep this question in mind as we move on. Now, that opening was not meant in any way to spark any sort of fear or shock value in you. Of course not. You were just telling people they were in danger of eternal conscious torment like a normal person making normal non-threatening statements. But the reality is that Jesus said that one day at judgment he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Now that's not the passage of scripture that we're going to look at in this particular video. I don't know. Seems like one that's worth looking at considering the topic. It's this passage from Matthew 7 saying that not everybody who says Lord, Lord, or even does miracles will end up in heaven. And this is problematic. The Bible's a messy book full of varied mixed messages about salvation, so my critiques of Alan aren't meant to let it off the hook. This passage is a prime example. It could easily be taken as suggesting that you can accept Jesus as Lord and go to hell, but then if you're really bound and determined, you can read it as being about people who proclaim God's name and do Christian-looking stuff while choosing not to accept Christ. It's a little up in the air, leaving Christians free to assume it means whatever they already believe. But what I believe is happening in our society today is that we are placing such a huge emphasis on just believe, believe, believe. And let me be very, very clear. Believing in Jesus Christ is the only prerequisite for being a Christian. So believing is the only criteria for salvation, but it's a problem when people say believe, believe, believe? It's going to take some pretty fine hair splitting to maintain both these stances at the same time. The question is, what does it actually mean to believe, and what does it actually look like to believe, and is your belief consistent with your behaviors? Because James says that if you have faith without works, that is a dead faith. And here's that hair splitting at work. Believing in Jesus is the only way to salvation. However, if you believe in Jesus, you're clearly going to display good works. This qualifier muddies the idea of what salvation looks like and, depending on how it's articulated, how certain you can be of it. I mean, sure, the idea is supposed to be that good works are just an outward sign of belief, meaning Christians can use it to size up whether other people are saved while being sure of their own standing with God. So far so good, I guess, if you're into that kind of thing. But it doesn't take much to get you from assessing other people's salvation to questioning your own. Because what if you're a Christian who made an honest profession of faith, yet you're not producing works? Wouldn't this kind of strict qualifier make you doubt your own salvation? I mean, you can know you said the prayer, but can you measure whether you meant it? In fact, if you think this through, it quickly extrapolates to doubt for every single Christian on the planet. Because how many and what kinds of good works are sufficient? There's no description of this. Ever. So if salvation is attached to belief and belief is attached to works, and all you have to measure works is your gut-level feeling of what's enough, then how could you not endlessly question your salvation? This is where the Bible's various ideas about salvation are so convoluted that the only way for Christians to be confident they're saved, or even to maintain a coherent idea of what that means, is to develop their own personal instinctive concept of salvation that turns a blind eye to parts of the Bible. I'm, I would add that. For me, and on the and in my mind, why something as important as an eternal destiny, eternal resting place, is hinged on faith and belief. Something that, for the most part, is based on some psychological manipulation, some emotional inducement, some persuasion, and some system of grooming or programming. Because, but as I've always been saying, and especially what I said in the last video, that a particular person in the coming spirit and coming to them. If you don't question your beliefs, we just follow the program, don't it? And so, if you believe that, all you have to do is believe to enter. Okay. Or if you believe that, you just believe in Jesus. But you don't need to know what is Jesus. You don't need to know his history. 
they need to know that it's true or not. They just need to believe the story. Because that's what they find. The story. Yes, people. It's a story. And people have made it seem as though it is more than a story. A story that can be interpreted in many different ways. And I've been seeing this. And when I make these assertions, people look at me and say, oh, Dr. Malin, you don't understand the deal about Jesus and this and that and all manner of things. The reality is that it is a story left up to interpretation, and those that have varying interpretations will go in various different paths. So, it's one thing to believe, to believe, there's another thing to think that your belief is the only thing that justifies your, 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 your path to what in the destiny of there, there needs to be more, there needs to be some evidence, there needs to be some, some things that align to validate your beliefs to make it make sense and to make it be meaningful. The trick is that such an imprecise subconscious way of dealing with salvation gives people like Alan Parr room to threaten it and make you feel dependent on them to find it. Great for getting people to watch through the end of your video, I guess, but just incredibly sleazy. So I believe that there is another passage of scripture that we're going to dig into today in this particular video that if it was explained to more people who say they want to be a disciple, who say they want to be a Christian, before they actually walk down this road, if they were to truly think about it and try to uh, understand whether it is they want to take this step, I think we'd have a whole lot less false conversions and a whole lot less people who are deconstructing their faith. Hmm, this is an interesting side comment. It almost makes me wonder whether this video arose from deep heartfelt concern over the salvation of Christians or a need to explain away deconversions. Let's jump in. Beginning in Luke chapter 14, verse 25, it says this, now great crowds were traveling with him. Now let's just stop right here. We're gonna break this passage of scripture down. I want you to visualize this for just a moment. You may have to close your eyes and I want you to imagine this huge crowd of people who are traveling with Jesus and basically they've heard about what he can do. They've heard about him raising the dead and healing the blind and, and healing the sick and doing all these different things. And, and maybe they're following him because they want to see a magic show. Maybe they're following him because they need something from him. They want to be healed. They want their, uh, their, their family members to be healed or whatever it is. But what Jesus is getting ready to say in this passage, he is going to separate the committed from the crowd. Notice that he just spent almost 45 seconds inserting his own framing into a really short Bible verse. Literally all the Bible itself said was that great crowds were traveling with Jesus. All of this stuff came straight out of the mind of Alan Parr and he just imposed it onto the text. This is something he's going to do a lot in this video. As he does, keep a few questions in mind. Do we know everything he's saying about the passage is true? How much is speculation, even if reasonably well-informed speculation? If this extra context is accurate, is it needed to understand the passage? If so, why did God not include it in the Bible? And what happens to people who read the Bible yet missed all Alan's commentary? If he thought it was necessary, God could have put literally every word Alan said into scripture, but he didn't. Yet Alan's claiming that you might go to hell if you don't come to him for all this information. And I want you to ask... And I want to also again hear that this is one of the hit forms of believers. Every believer think you have the right message of every believer can be the individual of Jesus and God. Every believer has something extra to, to share about the Bible, about the scriptures. And they speak these words as though it is a it is a it is in itself an authority to what the Bible actually says. I know because I used to do the same thing. And I can tell you from first time experience that that's nothing but ego appeal. Yes, that's the harsh truth. It's ego appeal. 
because I am pre-proposing that my thoughts, my understanding, my interpretation is actually what is written in the Bible. And I am pre-proposing that the, the ideas I come up with after reading the Bible are in fact what is in the mix, what is what is supposed to be or uh, what is supposed to be understood from the Holy scripture. And every believer will do it. Every person. And so I come on by telling people that whichever literature, not just the Bible, whichever literature you come across, um, whatever um, material you may come across, you, you, you first you first interpret that. So your interpretation will form your perception and your perception will give you a, a reality. And that is what is happening in the realm of Christianity and in general. You know, our interpretations of what we see around us and we have to form your perceptions and form our perceptions will create our realities. That is what's going on here. Religion is no exception yourself while you're going through this passage with me are you just part of the crowd of people that are following jesus or are you part of the committed that jesus is going to explain and describe here now let's keep going now great crowds were traveling with him so he turned and said to them if anyone comes to me now let's just stop right there because what we see here is that whatever jesus is going to say next he is applying it to anyone and everyone who says they want to be a follower of Jesus, a disciple, anyone who names the name Christian. He says, what I'm getting ready to say is what I am requiring of somebody who says they want to be a disciple. Because oftentimes we think, oh, you know what? Uh, I can do this because I'm not a pastor. I'm not a minister. I'm not a missionary. I'm not this, I'm not in ministry. Oh, no, no, no. What Jesus is getting ready to say is, it, it, whatever it is, I, I'm applying it from the pulpit to the pew. So put yourself in the sandals of these people who are tagging along with Jesus. It would be pretty understandable if you were there just because you like watching miracles, right? Who wouldn't show up for that kind of thing? Especially back then when there wasn't much to do because all they had was like black and white TVs and stuff. So it would seem like Jesus should get why they were there, and that if he wanted more... I don't think you have black and white TVs then, but... Um from them he'd explain and i mean explain in concrete x y and z terms that way there's no misunderstanding and if you choose to stick around without x y and z you know exactly what you're doing by contrast you'd have every reason to be totally appalled if you were just trudging along with him thinking everything's fine and suddenly he just punishes you for reasons you were never clear about and by the way it wouldn't help much if he was cryptic about his expectations but then said well, you have no excuse, because see that guy over there in that part of the crowd? No, not that one. The one there with a the white t-shirt and strangely shiny jacket. If you'd have gone and talked to him, he could have explained exactly what I meant. But you didn't, so now go to hell. That would be a pretty garbage move for Jesus to make, right? Well, this is what Alan suggests is happening to Christians today. The only difference is we're talking about the Bible instead of Jesus and Alan instead of a guy in the crowd. In case you're slow at following analogies. Did you know that Python is now the number one programming language in the world? That's right. According to the two. Okay, let's just see what he says. The first quality of a disciple, somebody who says they want to be a Christian, is that they elevate their faith over their family. Wait, the first quality of what? A Christian? A person going to heaven? No, a disciple. So how do we even know that Jesus is talking about qualifications for salvation? Think about it. A disciple is usually understood to be a person who follows someone else's teachings to the point of offering unquestioning loyalty and all-consuming devotion. So if the Bible ever in any way indicates that accepting Jesus is the requirement for salvation but then gives other requirements for being a disciple, might you not suspect that these are two different things? Maybe that a disciple is a Christian who shows an exceptional level of devotion? The church I grew up in taught that. I mean, maybe they're wrong, but with the Bible being written in a way that's up for question, maybe, you know, Alan's wrong. And his reading seems a little tenuous, if not far-fetched. 
So maybe he shouldn't try to get people to fear eternal torment based on how he connects the dots in an ambiguous text. Notice it says here, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and later on it says, he cannot be my disciple. So Jesus is basically laying it down here. Now, I want you to understand that the way Jesus is using the word hate here, he's not talking about uh, uh, seeing somebody in a negative light. So when he told you to hate people, he didn't mean to hate them. Got it. He's basically using hyperbole. Oh, cool. Hyperbole. The kind of imprecise and easily misunderstood language you should use when giving people life and death instructions. To set the bar so high that he's basically saying, how you see me and everybody else, there should be such a huge gap between your faith and every other relationship, so much so that in comparison to me, it seems as though you hate these people because you're so prioritizing your relationship with me. So imagine. So this is the thing I'm trying to get people to understand. Here's this brother reading the scriptures and giving them his interpretation of the scripture. Now, as this presenter is showing you, if the Bible was written, written in a way that it was clearly crystal clear, there would be no need for this God to give any certain interpretation. If not try to read it and understand. But you might know, have uh, not coming with God, the Holy Spirit who can do the things of God. Which therefore means only special people put it up with. As opposed to read the Bible, because only special people get the Holy Spirit. And that is the case. Why even bother? That is the point in general to evangelize people. Because when special people can get the Holy Spirit. These are some of the issues I've found. These are some of the things I talked about and I've been talking about over the years. These are some of the things that me, we can no longer believe. God just does not at all. There are some logical inconsistencies there, and it just does not allow me to be, it doesn't align with me anymore in a practical sense. Imagine I was taking a bunch of kids camping and we got lost. They ask me if they can eat some plants they found just growing all over the place, and I say, those are poisonous. So naturally, they don't eat them. Days pass by, and as I see them getting dangerously weak with hunger, I ask, why weren't you eating those plants? And they say, you said they were poisonous. So far, the conversation makes sense, right? But then imagine I clarify my advice like this. Well, when I said they were poisonous, I didn't mean they were bad for you. They're actually pretty nutritious. I was just saying there should be such a gap between how you see these plants and how you see a well-balanced home-cooked meal that these plants should seem poisonous by comparison. That would be incredibly stupid, right? In fact, given the stakes, it would be grossly irresponsible. So with heaven and hell on the line, how much more irresponsible would it be for Jesus to say, hate your family, when he really meant all the stuff Alan said? Why say something that most Christians would recognize as unacceptable on its face and leave them to read between the lines and maybe or maybe not arrive at their own conclusions? Or survive until the year 2023 and watch a video by someone who apparently knows how to explain it. And so, listen, you might be in a situation where it's difficult to share your faith with your family or your friends, or you might risk embarrassment or shame or whatever. And Jesus is saying, if you want to be a disciple, you have to be willing to elevate your relationship with me, with Jesus Christ, and that has to take preeminence over every single other relationship. The person that you're dating, even the person that you're married to, every other relationship. To sum up, you need to put your personal understanding of religion over every other person you know. Doesn't sound like a super healthy or humble way to live your life. Quality number two, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. If you aren't a Christian who automatically assumes this is acceptable because it's Jesus talking, crazy cult leader alarm should be going off like crazy when you hear this. So now he's talking about sacrifice over self-centeredness. You see, there's this tendency in our lives to want to do what we want to do. 
and to do our will. But Jesus is saying, I am calling anyone who wants to be a disciple to a life of surrender, a life of sacrifice, where we constantly put down what we want in exchange for what God wants. Why is this presented as a binary choice between selfishness and doing what Alan Parr says an invisible deity wants you to do? I don't believe in God, but I should and do sacrifice for the sake of others. But see, what we want to do is we want to compartmentalize our lives. We have certain things that we say, okay, God, I'm going to give you control over this. Oh, but not over this. Right? I'll, I'll let you control over my money. I'll give money to the church. Oh, but I don't want you to control my, my sexuality or my dating relationships or my marriage or what you, know, you may want me to do with my career or my money. So, so it's like we're, we're, we're got one foot in, but there's some areas of our lives where we're just not willing to surrender. If you feel like you need to alter all these areas of your life to fit what you or someone else thinks that God wants, then fine. It's an imprecise and potentially unhealthy way to live your life, but up to you. But even though the Bible glorifies this unconstructive choice, I don't think it's clear, or at least not consistently clear, that you need to do all this to be saved. And he says, if you want to be a disciple, what I'm calling you to is a life of total and complete surrender. See, this passage, it needs to be explained to new Christians. And this is precisely the problem. God's word is written in such a way that it needs to be explained by Alan or someone who interprets it the same way he does. So say you just got saved. If you just start reading the Bible for yourself, you might miss this passage or not understand it. If you go ask a pastor who explains it differently than Alan does, you'll get the wrong idea about it. Either way, you go to hell. Alan's saying the quiet parts just a little too loudly. So that they know exactly what they are getting themselves into and what they are signing up for from the jump. Let's keep going. So in other words, and I, I'm sure you, I'm almost sure you, you get the picture, but you get the picture by now. This guy, Alan, is screaming in 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 explicit terms that he has the right interpretation of the correct interpretation of what these passages of scriptures actually mean. Therefore he's standing or sitting in this case as an authority, as an authority to proclaim to new believers and even as you call them deconverted Christians and so to, to see what where they are going wrong in their faith and to see how they could do better. He's sitting on, as someone in this seat of authority that has the truth as it relates to this subject matter. Well, this is a presumptuous place to be. And I was in this presumptuous place and I can understand why he's doing it. He's actually, if you look at it from the other perspective, he doesn't see what he's doing as in any way, shape or form, as being hurtful or discouraging or um, maybe see that he's a little friend, but he doesn't see that it is someone misleading and cannot be true in the sense of what we are looking for in this whole um, scheme of things. Because the truth is nobody knows the truth again in this subject matter. This is a story that has been written for many years and has been given to us, and even though it's not in its original language, and we are to accept it, we are to believe it, we are to live by it, no questions asked. And not only that, we are to listen to people like Alan, who seem to get a, a direct word from God and Jesus because he has the Holy Spirit, and most of us don't have it. And so his word, is almost as though it is God's word in the context of how he's presenting it. And that's a big issue. Quality number three, pain over pleasure. Now notice it says here, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So when explaining what people need to do to follow him, Jesus uses a metaphor. Great. You see, in these days, there were a lot of people who were losing their lives because of their faith. And here's the reality, saints. Jesus, for most of us, is not even calling us to a life where we might be in jeopardy of, of losing our lives or being a martyr. 
He is just simply saying, you know what? In this life, there's going to be pain. There's going to be difficulty. There's going to be humiliation. There's going to be shame. There's going to be suffering. There's going to be all of these. There's going to be loss. There's going to be financial struggles. There's going to be marital stress, strain, and struggles. No, Jesus isn't saying that. Alan is. Jesus just said to take up your cross. And while this clearly seems like a metaphor for bearing some kind of burden, it's an imprecise metaphor and Alan's taking huge liberties in defining what it means. But see, the issue for many of us, because we're not taught this, since it's not clearly explained in the Bible, because we've been fed this cotton candy gospel, this watered down version of the gospel, this seeker sensitive type of gospel, this gospel from the church and from the pulpit, oftentimes where they're afraid to mention sin, they're afraid to call out certain things, they're afraid to, to challenge people to go deeper in their faith. When I was in Christian school, we were taught that the Catholic Church was all corrupt and tried to get people to go to priests to teach and interpret the Bible. But then, so the story goes, Protestants like Martin Luther came along and said that the Bible is the sole authority for Christian doctrine and that all Christians should have access to it themselves. This means that you can read what God wants without depending on church leadership, and in fact it's your responsibility as a believer to do so. So then what happens if a preacher teaches you a cotton candy gospel? Well, you compare it to the actual gospel, recognize he's obviously wrong, and ignore him. Absolutely no problem, right? Now I guess you might fall for the cotton candy one if you don't read your Bible enough, but if that's the case, Alan should just say, hey, read your Bible more. But instead, he says, hey, don't listen to how those guys explain the Bible, listen to how I explain it instead. Handy for him, but it seems to regress back to pre-Protestant reliance on priests instead of the sola scriptura idea of getting teaching straight from scripture. Maybe the Protestants aren't as different from the Catholics as they like to think. What happens is when these things come into their lives, they're disillusioned and they don't know what to think because they've been fed this lie that everything in their life is going to go well. And as a result, whenever pain comes, whenever it's time for them to carry their own cross. Do your kids play video games? <laughs> Mine do. And with summer in full swing, they're already playing way more than usual. They want to shake their angry fists in the face of God and ultimately leave the church and ultimately leave the faith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Never a true Christian. I get it. I've heard that so many times. I never truly know about it. I never have the Holy Spirit. I never truly believe it. You are possessed. You, you are deceived. You are deceived. Nothing. So these Christians, I call them Christians on a higher voice. These Christians on a higher voice think because you no longer believe and they still believe they are better than you. Therefore, they think they have the authority to tell you. One of the things I don't ever recall doing was saying to somebody that they were never children of Christian or never children believe. Because I knew when I was like this, I knew that much. I didn't know anything. I knew I did not have the authority to say that to somebody. I did not want that But a lot of Christians feel they do. And it's troubling to say the least. Not so much to me anymore, but the idea that we can feel these things and say and utter these things to people is troubling. And Jesus is saying, hey, look, I'm actually calling you to a, a life that is going to include pain, difficulty, and hardship. Number four, relationship over religion. Notice he says here, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me, or another version says, follow me, cannot be my disciple. Now, do you see the strong language that Jesus is using here? Cannot go to heaven? Cannot be my disciple. Oh yeah, that one. So he's inviting us to a, to a relationship with him, not just religion. Pay very close attention to what this passage says and what Alan says as I put it on screen. Maybe we'll find that he takes a few liberties in making this about relationship versus religion. He says, you have to follow me. What does that look like? That means spending time with him. That means praying. That means fasting. That means trusting. That means learning. That means obeying. That means worshiping. All That means putting our, our, our trust in him. See, what religion is, okay, let me go to church, let me give some money, maybe let me 
you know, uh, hang out with some Christian friends or whatever. No, that those are all religious activities. What Jesus is calling us to is a life of intimate fellowship with him. I'm not the one that writes. He says, look, if you don't come after me and follow me in relationship, he says, you cannot be my disciple. Whoa, now this is some hardcore bullshit. We just saw him add a lot of commentary to the text to get from Jesus' command to take up your cross and follow me to Alan's statement that it's about relationship, not religion. Here he takes it a step further, going so far as to pretend he's getting straight to the words of Jesus I'm not the one that writes before quoting him as saying, if you don't come after me and follow me in relationship, you cannot be my disciple. But the word relationship is not in there. I even checked across the most common English translations and didn't see anything like it even once. You might argue he's paraphrasing when he adds it, but he definitely makes it sound like part of the quote. Regardless, this isn't something that could be reasonably read between the lines of this passage anyway. When Jesus says, follow me, he seems to mean join my movement or follow my teachings. In relationship isn't naturally inferred from the text and has to be imposed on the text by someone looking to make it mean what they want it to mean. It's pretty brazen for Alan to make such an imposition after telling people, I'm not the one who writes it. Number five, commitment over convenience. Let's see what it says. But don't begin, I'm reading this from the New Living this time, until you count the cost. I love this. He says, hey, this is what I've been getting to this entire video. He says, don't even start down the road of saying you want to be a Christian. You want to be a disciple of Christ. He says, don't begin until you think about it until you consider, until you count the cost of what might be required of you as a fully devoted follower of Jesus. That's why I said this passage needs to be taught to every single new believer. Why do you need to teach the passage? Why not just show them the passage? If God wrote it clearly, then, well, you all get the idea by now. I hope it actually gets what is going on here again. This is a whole point of why I'm no longer, one of the reasons I'm no longer believe. There is, there is a lot of injection, there's a lot of ideas being thrown around about how you should interpret the Bible. Persons think that their interpretation is better than yours, or their interpretation is true and yours is false. And they will say, see, this is what the Bible says, but they, they are their own twist or their own interpretation to, to to keep it in you know, this love and you know, this situation you, you, you don't even want to think about it as well not not gonna work with him anymore this is another bible on the left alan on the right thing where he adds a bunch of his own commentary but this one's even worse once you look a little closer notice how alan suddenly switches to the new living translation a version well known for taking liberties with trying to convey the intended thoughts of the authors rather than strictly translating the text of the manuscripts. Using this version, he pulls the statement, but don't begin until you count the cost from the start of verse 28. But here's the really interesting part. That line only exists in the very loose New Living Translation. It's not in any of the more literal mainstream versions. Seriously, look at the screen. Every single one just launches straight into Jesus' analogy about building a tower. And as far as I can tell, so does the original Greek. So apparently the New Living Translation just added the opening line out of nowhere. I guess the translators thought it would be helpful to sum up the point of Jesus' coming analogies with a literal command? I'm not sure. It's kind of weird and shows a lack of trust in the Bible to make its point. This tells It also shows that it could not be divinely inspired. There are so many different translations, so many different re revisions of the Bible. And each revision comes with its own nuances and own, its own way of reading and interpreting the scriptures. Now, something divinely inspired would first, would first need no revision. Remember, it, in its own Text it says it was the Bible was written by men, holy men, as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And most believers understand that to mean the Holy Spirit of God. Therefore, there would be no need for a revision. 
And as they presented, you are saying, there would be no reason for an external explanation because all knowing, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, all wise men would have written in such a way that even a child could really can understand it without questions or doubts. But that's not the case. There's way over many people here. And that is why you have what is called the school of theology, where they teach pastors and leaders to interpret the Bible and to teach people in the congregation how to interpret the Bible. But let's continue. We're almost there. Tells us something about what Alan's doing here. Instead of building his excessive commentary on scripture, here he makes a point of going to a uniquely loose translation so he can pull an interjection made by his translators and build his commentary on that. It's basically commentary on top of commentary. He's so far removed from the Bible at this point there's barely any pretense about what he's doing. And he even mangles this statement by adding stuff about going down the road of being a Christian, which drastically changes the meaning to one more explicitly about salvation. Believers. As a matter of fact, if you have a friend who just got saved within the last year, send them this video and make sure they watch this so that they are not disillusioned about what it means to truly be a Christian. Let's keep going. Notice that he doesn't say, if you have a friend who just got saved, show them Luke 14, 28. He says, if you have a friend who just got saved, send them to this video. Is he being clear enough about what he's up to? From here, a lot of Alan's video is just going through more of Jesus' analogies, which gets repetitive without saying much. So we're going to skip over it and get to where we hear Alan say this neat little thing. So many people starting down the road of building their faith. Only to leave it partially built. I believe the word that we call that is deconstruction. I believe that we would have less stories of deconstruction today if on the front end of someone's conversion, we clearly taught them what it means to be a disciple. Based on how often he keeps taking these jabs, it sounds like what's eating at him is the existence of former believers. He's so averse to the idea of Christians starting to find their faith unbelievable, you know, the actual reason for deconversion, that he makes up this weird condescending thing about them rage quitting because they didn't know what they were getting into and weren't mature enough to handle it. And he's so invested in this, they were never true Christians narrative, that he threatens members of his own religion by saying, maybe you're not true Christians either. But come on, dude. If you're mad at us, take it out on us. Don't go home and vent your frustration at your own family. Anyway, after he goes on about Jesus' salt analogy, he says this. Now, my friend, listen. I know at this point in the video, you might be scared. Yeah, people tend to get scared if they believe in hell and you tell them they might be going there. You might be thinking, listen, this video was not intended to spark crazy fear in you, to make you question your salvation. No, no, no. But it was intended as a heart check, as a warning. And for some of you watching this video, it should create some fear. Crazy fear seems like a much more appropriate reaction to the possibility of burning alive forever than some fear. The idea that you can say that is alarming. You often hear in church, God is love, God is good, God is time, God is God is this, God is that. Everything that is good is good. Everything is that, that is one is the devil. But you also read in the Bible that is vengeance and the day of darkness. They see what those elements coming out. So there is this fear aspect in the scripture to keep you in check, to keep you just close enough that you don't feel abandoned by this dark or far enough. That they don't see uh, as though he's not watching. So, in other words, without the fear element, you would not need to take it this seriously. Without the, again, without the concept of help, you would not need to take this whole thing so seriously. And I'm not saying that you should not take a Christian seriously if you're not watching the Christian, the belief, whatever, the faith you have. I'm saying. 
for the tenants of these universal units are pretty much most few among them. The ideas are, are there if you really look at it, and it is to keep in check, to go into question, to at least be behind me, and to let it come and form to an ideology that we are not sure where the authors are part of those. And that if you do question these things, you are, um, you are in, in trouble with time, or in trouble with the farming of your time. Can't see why I should think that it. it seems like he wants to close by suddenly walking back the severity of the threats he's making to his audience. Indeed, he just told them he doesn't want to make them question their salvation, when the whole point of this video is to introduce questions about their salvation. But hey, what's verbal abuse if you don't follow it up with gaslighting, right? Because if you've gone most of your life, and if you're being honest with yourself, just honest, you have no relationship with Jesus. Again, more wishy-washy walking back of his point. He talked about how people are misled by cotton candy preachers and are going to die and be surprised to find out they hadn't been a Christian, which means they were misinformed. But now these misled, mistaken people are supposed to know they're not really saved if they're just honest with themselves? Alan's just wildly inconsistent, which is a bad idea considering the topic. He wraps up with a call to figure out whether you're a true Christian. Look at the warning signs he gives. You may call out to him whenever you need something or you pray whenever something's in trouble. But, but you, let's be honest, you, you don't really read your Bible. You don't really pray. And you're really not going to church. And it hasn't just been that way for a short season. This has been a consistent theme of yours for most of your life. This video was intended for you. This passage of scripture was intended for you because it's intended for you to take a close look at your life and ask yourself the question, am I really a Christian? The thing about the criteria he lists is that it's all vague. Now, of course, the question of whether you have a relationship with Jesus is intangible by nature. But then when he gets to anything at all concrete, he expresses it using vague qualifiers. You don't really read your Bible. You don't really pray. You don't really go to church. But what does really mean for all these things? Sure, some people might be confident that they obviously do or don't do these things enough, but not everybody. So with heaven and hell on the line, with Christians dealing with varying amounts of personal anxiety or shame and self-doubt, we're just going to toss out the blanket idea that you might end up in hell because you don't really do these things that almost all Christians struggle with making a habit of? That even the most devout wonder if they do enough? It's horrid, and Alan should be ashamed of himself. But the bigger problem is, he's not the only one doing this. Christianity is just filthy with people saying this kind of thing. So even as Alan points to other preachers saying you might go to hell if you listen to them, others are pointing back at him saying the same thing. Then it's not even enough just to find the right religion, daunting as that task is if you're actually realistic about it. Within that religion, you need to hope you chose correctly from among the jungle of teachers who are all pointing at each other and saying, all those guys will lead you to hell, but you can find the way over here at my church. Or YouTube channel, I guess. It's self-serving and gross, and the threat of hell should never be wielded so freely and in such a haphazard fashion. But then that takes us back to an even more fundamental issue, which is that nobody should be making threats of hell at all. I guess it shows that once you open up that kind of silly Pandora's box, you can make literally anybody feel unsafe. Good job, Alan Parr. And so that was the presentation. And the takeaway I wanted to have from this presentation is that, again, there are those out there who believe they are either right hand of God. And they might not ultimately say that to you, but their behavior, their action is all over. It's all over. It's all over their actions. Their behavior, they might fully present the thing. And, I am not saying people should not share their faith. I'm not I'm saying that people should deny what they hold in the street. What I am saying is that don't think that because you are sharing your faith and because you're holding on to what you believe is true, you have the authority to condemn others. Even in the most certain and um, the most or the least um, insignificant ways. Even though 
even the way you present your message, you're condemning people. And I'm not saying that people should not be accountable. I'm not saying that I would. I'm saying the idea that unfortunately English persons used to judge per people are is in itself questionable. The authority, which in this case is about is questionable. And this is why I make or uh, I used officially because I'm still not officially making videos. If I was officially making videos, you'd see tags, you'd see my tags, and you'd see my thumbnails and stuff like that, and introductions and all that. Not doing that anymore. I don't care about YouTube's algorithm and just sharing my views. And so, um, with that said, I hope you and understood and I hope you enjoyed this video. There are many other videos like this, and this is going to be a part of a series I will do from time to time, wherein I'm, I'm, I'll be going further into responding to the comment I receive, and I'll be giving probably an official reason as to why I'm not a Christian, but people who are still not there will have a better understanding. But that's it for now. As always, the knowledge be your part. Truth be done. Peace.